I really looked closely at the syllabus, uh, which is a lecture, ostensibly, about teaching and theory on the last day of the first week <laughs> before lunch <laughs> to be followed by a seminar on all of those things after lunch. Um, so a couple of caveats before I get started. Okay, thank you, thank you for that. I appreciate it. You're very kind, very kind. I, uh, you know, I'm very fragile, so I appreciate you taking care of me uh, here and, and at home. Um, so a couple of caveats. First of all, uh, I, this will not be uh, really a lecture. Um, <laughs> again, I appreciate that very much. Thank you. That, um, uh, this is not really going to be a lecture. Uh, I'm hoping it'll be a little bit more interactive than that. Um, the second caveat is I don't really know how to, like, I don't know more about teaching than I think any of you do. And I'm not totally confident that what I do in a classroom works class to class, semester to semester, year to year, decade to decade, um, institution to institution, right? So, um, so I'm not, and I'm not going to give a, a bunch of exercises. We can talk about some of those, um, or things that I've done. I'm happy to discuss things that I've done that, that have worked. Um, I do want, over the course of the next you know, 45 minutes or so, to talk a little bit about uh, how I approach some of the stuff, like the intersection of digital technologies and theory uh, with my students. I'd, I'd also like um, to make sure that before we conclude this session that I give you some of the resources that I draw on quite a lot um, uh, so that you have them as, as, as well. Um, I'll, it occurred to me when we were, you know, when I was looking at the title of teaching theory, right, you can kind of take that in two ways, right? It's like the, the how to teach theory, but it's also the theory of how to teach. Um, and in, uh, in, in a lot of my work, I, I almost always think about what I'm doing is having some kind of pedagogical, right, or learning value for someone, right? Sometimes it's my peers. Um, sometimes it's my superiors, right? The tenure dossier being a very particular uh, genre of writing form, for example. Um, sometimes um, it's, it's my students. The other caveat is that uh, a few years ago, I started and wrote and, and, and taught all too briefly in a graduate program. But for the, for the past three years, um, I've been surrounded by very privileged 18 to 22 year olds. Right? Um, emphasis on the very in that sentence. Right? Uh, so, so it's a very particular kind of teaching environment. Um, I teach a lot. Uh, I tend to teach a lot of intro stuff. Um, I've taught big and small and, and all, over the, all over the place. Um, but, uh, but before we get going too much further, um, oh, uh, one uh, final caveat. Um, I've also tried to adapt this uh, to speak in some ways, and I've been more successful with certain people than others, to things that are coming up in your projects. So I've, I've you know, kind of taken things that I, I, I know a little bit about or I've thought a little bit about and tried to kind of link them to the things that you are thinking about. It is not going to touch on everybody's fully, but hopefully it will touch on, on enough of you that um, you can convince <laughs> the other people that this was not a waste of their time. Um, okay, so but before we get started, Things that are on your mind or that you would like to see covered either this morning or this afternoon when it comes to teaching. Yeah, Alicia. Um, I'm students at risk, first-gen students who mm. are not necessarily prepared for college and have difficulty approaching text. Mm. Yes, OK, great. Can I add? Oh, sorry. No, 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 please. Uh, uh, to add on to that, maybe students who don't have access to their own technology, except for possibly on a campus, which could vary, obviously, amongst all of us. <laughs> Noted. Yes. Yeah, Mike? Um, theory, in my world, it tends to be synonymous with uh, expository, analytic, argumentative essays. Yep. Uh, I want to actually raise kind of a couple things in response to that. So one, how can we do theory differently? Okay, so as a form of theoretical praxis or performance or making of some kind. And the second side of this is that 
Uh, I want to make sure in my teaching, and I'm still working on this, how to give agency and equity to the things I am theorizing about, right? So to put, for example, to make, say, uh, Kafka's penal colony, have as much agency in a conversation about penality and discipline and so on as Foucault's essay, so that the Kafka is, crit is allowing me to critique Foucault, mm -hmm. right? So that idea of, the, of not dissecting the work, but giving it its own voice and agency in a theoretical conversation. I hope that, that's kind of an obtuse point. It's difficult for me to even articulate, which is part of the problem, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I had no idea what you were saying, so I will ignore that. <laughs> but no, I, I, I take your point, right? Like, how do, you, how do you keep works alive in the classroom for themselves and not let them just become cadavers that we sort of use theoretical scalpels on to carve up into little bitty pieces? Yeah, Catherine? The value of analysis and how to make it exciting. Mm -hmm. um, just this, that what theory does to performance, what, what, just that pulling apart and any exercises around that, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, making the interfaces, the digital interfaces that our students live with every day, both visible and bounded in the classroom. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna take a couple more, yeah, Jenna? Accessibility. So accessibility of the content, um, and also I should mention of the actual. Yep. Yeah, the actual yep. Yeah, Let's just say languages and terminologies to be able to argue for the resources that we need in the classroom from those other places on campus mm -hmm. that would provide them. <laughs> okay. Um, that that last one um, is probably going to be most fully. We can most fully explore that this afternoon. Um, uh, I have. I think. I think I have things that are going to touch on most of these from what I have here, but this question of advocacy on behalf of teaching with administration, um, that's, a, that's a, I think, a separate one and actually is, is better accessed in conversation with each other um, uh, and, and relates uh, not in, in, in indirectly to the uh, Twitter discussion, right, of theater as, uh, and its value, right, that um, Mike and a few other people have been participating in. There was another hand over here. Yeah, Rye and then Tiffany. Uh, I have two. One is uh, something Derek said on Monday stuck with me, which is that uh, he's terrified to be in the classroom with these technologies that he doesn't necessarily know as well as, say, like a computer science student. Yeah. So one question is um, teaching about him with these technologies that we are, are ourselves still learning and grappling with. Sure. And then the second is um, uh, something you said that's stuck with me is, is this week a couple of times is that we can never forget that these technologies, these are military technologies, right? So how do we kind of teach with and about these technologies while still holding that tension and criticality? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, Tiffany? I was also uh, going off of the accessibility issue. So I primarily have um, undergraduate students. So how do you make these kind of very theoretical, very abstract ideas accessible and understandable for the 18 to 22 year olds and then going along with that um, providing them with the tools to do something with them and create and make and and get away from that conventional 10 to 12 page research paper sure okay um so so i don't know if i'm going to hit everything um this is a good starting point anything we don't uh, cover right now um we can absolutely pick up um later this afternoon i'm going to start by talking i think mostly kind of in the theoretical uh conceptual area uh, about how I approach this. Um, and rather than tell you what I do, I'm kind of going to do a little bit of what I do. Um, uh, and then we can talk specifically about exercises and tools and techniques and questions of accessibility. And some of that, we're not going to resolve that, but some of that can also become a kind of brainstorming of, of how we can parlay that um, into, um, in, in, you know, in our discussions this afternoon. Um, I mean, one of the things I want to I start by saying, which is uh, I've worked on DH projects, I've collaborated, I've conceived of a couple, um, I've done a lot of uh, work with, with people in computer science and engineering. I love engineers, um, A, because they're incredibly well-funded at most institutions, <laughs> so they are much less competitive than, than people in the arts and sciences sometimes. Right, because people in the arts and sciences are, you know, like competing for crumbs, mm -hmm. right? And like, in, in, at least in my experience, the engineers like are like lions feeding on plenty of red meat, and they're like, <laughs> sure, we'll share our meal with you. Okay. Um, 
Uh, so they're really great. And the only way, the only thing you need to really know about engineers is that you have to give them an interesting problem to figure out, right? Um, and which is kind of the essence of theory. But but at its core, I am not really a DHist. Um, uh, I'm certainly not a computer scientist or a uh, or a programmer. Um, uh, and for years, I had a really hard time actually answering. I don't know if you have to do this on your like annual report, you know, where you put like what you are. Um, and they always give you an example, example like you know, I'm an organic chemist, right? I'm a th I'm a something. Right? And I would put like this kind of tortured, long. I am a scholar, investigated, interested, you know. And then I came up with the perfect phrase, which I now use all the time. So I'll use it again here. I am a theoretical theorist, <laughs> right? And it's like a theoretical physicist, right? In that. A theoretical physicist see, observes, analyzes, and predicts natural phenomena. I observe, analyze, and predict artificial phenomena. Right? Um, and I apply that lens to understanding uh, the world around me and the manifestations of performance and, and theater and, uh, and theatricality everywhere. And that's really my big agenda with my students, is to give them a critical frame that they develop themselves, that's in language that they write and create and pull on, and that is meaningful for them, and that they kind of take this out into the world uh, as, a, as, a, as a tool for decoding and understanding it, right? So, um, and in service to the things that they care about, right? Because I teach a lot of people who are never gonna make theater, right? I teach a lot of future financiers, right? And I love them, because I'm like, you will serve on boards one day. <laughs> this is a board. When you make your big pile of money, here's what you will do with that money, right? Um, uh, I teach a lot of people now who are interested in computer science, um, uh, and I teach a lot of people who are broadly invested in the, in the liberal arts and don't know what they want to do, right? Um, I see the world as theatrical. Uh, I see the tools of theater and theater making, and by theater I also include dance and, and various kinds of performance. Um, as well as media. If you've read any of my work, you know that like I put media and theater and theatricality on a spectrum in which they are never completely separate from one another. Um, so this is a little bit about how I approach this. Hopefully it will be somewhat interesting to you. I welcome contestation. Um, that would be the first thing I do in my classes, right? I can be wrong. Um, and I will actually give extra credit for people who can refute me with evidence, um, which is kind of fun. Um, it means that their glowing screens are usually put in service to fact-checking me, um, as opposed to Facebook, at least some of the time. There are some key uh, ideas that, um, that I use, and the, the first is probably the most important, and it addresses a couple of, of these questions, like the value of analysis, excitement, which is the re-familiarization, right? Um, you know, we, we're all familiar with, you know, distancing effect and defamiliarization, and I think especially when we talk about theory, like alienation effect is not just a, a, a phrase that r applies to Brecht, right? It's something that, that many of our students, uh, at least my, many of my students feel, right, separated from. So it's about basically reminding them of what they know and reminding them that what they know from wherever they come from has value, has use, and has application. Right? So it's about refamiliarizing material um, and this, this kind of major idea of meeting students where they are. I also believe very strongly in the, in the value of repetition, and you'll see it. I'm going to basically give you like, like repetition with revision, right? which is sort of like you know, Gertrude Stein by way of Susan Laurie Pons, <laughs> right? Um, right? That, that there is, um, you know, none of us learn anything well once. Right? And you even saw it yesterday, right, when, when Philip Auslander was giving his lecture and he gave you like a list of three things, and then like two sentences later he said, and what was the first thing? And everybody's like, well, at least me, I was like, <laughs> like I'm still trying to write, finish writing down the thing you said like two pages ago, right? You know, like that's like our brains do not necessarily assimilate and understand that kind of stuff. Um, and especially our students, like they are not Renaissance theater goers, right? They are not Elizabethans. They do not learn in the oral mode, right? They do not absorb that. That's why they listen to the same music over and over and over again, right? It's why I listen to the same music over and over and over again, so I can figure out what it is. Because the first time I hear it, I'm just, right? It's all coming at me, I have no idea. So repetition. The second is giving them permission to explore and experiment with an established ideas 
and to take things apart for themselves, even if it's wrong, right? That there is nothing so sacred or so, so beautiful that it cannot be um, improved on by them. So I do a lot of stuff with adaptations, um, manipulations, remixes. Um, and this also gives us not only the opportunity to use a wide variety of tools, um, and I've scaled a bunch of my teaching over the years to things that can be done with cell phones um, <clears throat> and text messages, right? Because almost everybody has access to texting. Um, even if you don't have access to, you know, Photoshop or something like that, or you don't have reliable access to a computer. Um, uh, and, then, and then the last is, is creative responses, and this is like sort of opening up the range. And again, I can talk a little bit about some of the stuff that I, I've done in the past um, that I've liked, um, but we can also, again, I think this afternoon is a great opportunity to um, talk through some of the material, but also to uh, think about what are some possible assignments that you might come out of, come out of this with. Um, so this, I'm going to give you a couple examples of my refamiliarization, right? So one of the things that when I'm looking for theorists is I'm looking for theorists and I'm looking for pieces of, of, of theory and ideas that have a direct connection to things that I know my students uh, are experiencing in the world. So one of my favorite things to talk about is, um, is surveillance, social media, and Marshall McLuhan, right, and TV. Um, my students are watching a lot of TV. I mean, they have, they have no idea. Like, they've never seen a TV set that looks like this. Um, right, let alone one that did not have a remote control, right? The idea that you had to, like, kafunk, 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 right? That's like, what? Right, like, media archaeology is kind of a fun part of class. Um, this is one of my favorite, my, favorite, my favorite quotes from him. This is actually um, one of his, um, not a terribly well-circulated text from 1970 um, called um, Anesthesia and uh, in a collection called From Cliché to Archetype. Um, and it's this, it's this great kind of comparison of the idea that satellite technology turns the whole world into a stage, right? So he goes back to Shakespeare um, and, uh, and, and the idea and that we're all living in a, in a, a proscenium arch, right? Um, and so I give this to my students and I say, you know, what does this make you think of, right? And immediately they're like, oh yes, this is like, this is social media, right? This is Facebook. I'm like, yeah, okay, you know, right? You're like, you're around in public doing your thing and then I, and then we make fun of people in the 70s, right? And what they wore. Um, and then I show them this, uh, the cover to this book, right? And now I know you're not supposed to judge books by their cover, but they can sometimes be very helpful to analyze, right? By their cover, right? And we look at this image of the, of the woman Right, who's a really, it's a very, if you look closely and think about it, it's a very strange image, right? For one thing, like she's all, almost like dis, disembodied of herself, right? She's got this kind of zony, uh, maybe kind of, maybe intoxicated of some kind. Um, you know, it's like, it's maybe it's a dance pose, right? It's, it's, a, it's taken from a fashion magazine, right? If we start to look at, at fashion magazines of the, of the late 1960s, we can start, start to see that. Um, and then we talk about this like echo, right, the behind her, right, this idea of trace and that she is not one person but many people and that her movements, right, leave, right, leave traces, leave echoes, right. And, and then I turn them and I say, okay, so, so that we're working on this and then I start talking about, okay, so, so our own technologies, right. Um, so this is a... This was a project from, from Microsoft Research called LifeSense. Um, and it was developed to help people with Alzheimer's. And it would take a photograph uh, periodically during the day so that at the end of the day, the person who had Alzheimer's could revisit those photographs as a way of recalling and triggering memory. Right? And they found that this was really helpful. Well, this sounds fantastic, right? Right? Brilliant. OK. Then I talked to them about this little project. This was originally called the Momoto. Um, it, it was then called the Narrative Clip, and I believe it was just bought by, by Google. Um, and it comes with this absolutely fabulous little promo video. This is back from when they were on Kickstarter, uh, I think it was like 2011, 2012. Um, and so I'll show them this, I show them this video. So, oh, did it not show me my video? There we go. Sometimes the best moments in life are 
the simple ones. The things that pass us by without us even noticing. The small surprises. And the everyday experiences. At Momoto, we love the simple moments, but we hate forgetting them. So we started thinking, what if we could capture those moments and create a true photographic memory? What if we could build a camera small enough to never be in the way and smart enough to capture life as we live it? As you live it. This is what we ended up with, the Momoto Life Logging Camera. It's small, light, weather protected, and takes beautiful 5 megapixel pictures. It was 2011. Just clip it on and it starts taking pictures. Put it down or place it in your pocket and it stops. It's that easy. And all the pictures are safely stored on Momoto storage service. We know what you're thinking. Two photos a minute is a whole lot of photos, right? Well, to make things as easy as possible, we developed apps for both iPhone and Android that automatically organizes the photos on a timeline. Want to remember the name of the restaurant last night? Easy. Thanks to Momoto's smart algorithm, GPS, and time data, you can just search, find, and share. We're really passionate about getting this product out into the world. We've been working for a year to develop the camera and apps, and we have a great team on the job. But we need funding to start production of the first thousand cameras. Help us reach this goal and be one of the first to wear a Momoto camera. Reserve one today. What could go wrong? <laughs> right? I mean, come on. If you could go back and like relive your childhood, that would be amazing. <laughs> so, okay, so I'm talking this, and this almost unfailingly creeps people out. Right? Um, I will admit I was one of the early contributor to, the, to this Kickstarter campaign. Um, but everyone in my house told me uh, that I was not allowed to ever wear the Momoto. Um, so I only got the t-shirt instead of the actual device. Right, and so then I tell people, and people are like, oh my god, that is horrible, right? I would never do such a thing. I'm like, I know, right? I'm like, okay, how many people are tracking, right, some part of the quantified self right now, right? And people are, you know, I've got, you know, I've got a fair number of Fitbits and, and Apple Watches. And then I'm like, okay, how many people have turned off all your location services on your phone, all of your tracking data on your phone, you have no web browsers loaded on your phone, you have no social media apps loaded on your phone, right? I mean, and like, and I can, I can, can you just, and I whittle it down until like, you know, maybe there is someone like, like Andrew Starter here who I'm going to out as a flip phone user, right? And he has the advantage of only being trackable by cell phone towers, which I will come back to in a, in later in the, in the talk, right? And all of a sudden it's like, okay, this is something that we are doing every day, we are thinking about every day, and then if we go back to that McLuhan slide, right, from 1970, oh, okay, starts to make a little bit of sense. Right? So you are performing all the time. Who is the audience? Well, increasingly it is algorithms. Right? Well, who, algorithms are not really an audience. Who are those algorithms? Right? Who's using those algorithms? Okay. Corporations, companies, right? And so all this, right? And this, this makes total sense that I could do this in about, you know, 10, 15 minutes in a, in a, in a, in a, in a classroom. Right? And so then I talk about, um, you know, this idea, this is actually from the Computer Electronics Show, now just CES, um, from 2013, right? So this is five years ago, right? And people are talking about how tech is now merging, merging with us um, and, and what that looks like, right? Um, so, okay, so I use, so I, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with the mid 20th century. Um, Phil Oslander was like, I don't know why I really like the mid, mid, mid 20th century. I'm like, I got a bunch of ideas why you love the mid 20th century. <laughs> Um, and a lot of them have to do uh, with the, develop the simultaneous development of, of commercial, commercially available television and, um, and the, uh, the emergence of cybernetics um, and how those then radiate together became two really key technologies that not only shaped our like, technological infrastructure but also shaped our conceptual metaphors right? um, and continue to today, right? that we are still operating within, I would argue, a kind of televisual 
framework uh, accelerated and accentuated by cybernetics, right? Um, Norbert Wiener in 1948 wrote that the 18th and 19th centuries had been the centuries of, of mechanization, um, that the 20th, century, the 20th century would be the century of communication and control, right? And when I start talking about like trains and Apple watches, my students are like, totally, <laughs> right? They get that. Um, and I love pulling in a bunch, of, a bunch of theory. And again, when I do this, especially with intro students, so I teach a class called Theater as Social Media, in which I combine kind of key moments in theater history and key play texts that I want them to understand with fairly high level, dense uh, theoretical texts that may or may not be contemporaneous with the play that we're talking about, mm -hmm. right? And one of my favorites um, that I use, and I've used it with a whole bunch of plays, it almost doesn't matter, um, but again, following on this idea of, of, of contemporary tech is Susan Sontag's On Photography. Um, I've taught the whole book, I've taught sections of the book, um, but this is my favorite, like my favorite quote, um, where she talks about um, that the more that video cameras become ubiquitous, the more they will be trained to narcissistic uses, that is to say self-surveillance, right? And then we have a whole conversation about selfies, right? And where they came from and why they're there and who's taken them and why they take them and what it means. Um, and this is where I pull in, and then I can pull in all kinds of things like discussions of ethics and copyright. And I can bring in issues of cut and paste. And I can connect them to, you know, the ways in which contemporary law is changing, because I get a fair number of lawyers, right? And then, you know, I mean, and so the idea is that, but then also, like, you know, why do, you know, why do you take a picture of yourself? Anywhere, right? What, what is that, what brings that value or meaning to you? And I will always get people who say, I never do that, right? And that is also a really helpful conversation. Why not, right? Why do you not? Um, and then just at the moment where I feel like they're falling asleep or they're fading off in this, I hit them with this photo, my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> Love this image. And yes, apologies to Emily McGinn. I did right click and just steal this off. Of, but, you know. um, and what's great is right then, and then this gives me a whole opportunity to talk about, you know, who is Susan Sontag, right? And who took this picture? Annie Leibovitz, right? Any weirdness going on there, right? Right? Susan Sontag writes like probably one of the most critical texts of uh, of photography and lived right for 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 many years with a photographer, perhaps the most recognizable photographer. <laughs> right, of, of, of the late 20th century. Um, and I love this image um, because I know very, very little about it, <laughs> right? I mean, I know, I, I, like, I know nothing about it other than really what I see here. Um, and I haven't really done any research on it, um, though I offer that invitation to my students. But then we kind, of, we kind of speculate. We start doing some analysis of this image, right? Like, why is Susan Sontag? And I show them a bunch of other pictures of Susan Sontag. Like, like this is not the typical Susan Sontag photo. <laughs> I don't know if you're familiar with some of her other images, but this is not generally how she represents herself as a public intellectual, <laughs> right? Um, we also then get to talk about media archaeology, right? That her laptop dates this image better than any other format. It's like, oh, okay. What what is that model of MacBook, right? When did it come out? Right? So now we kind of know where she is. And I just love it because I have this idea, and it could be totally wrong, but I have this idea that she, like, that she is going to a party where this is mandatory. Right? I choose, in my Susan Sontag imagination, that she does not do this for fun on weekends, although that might be even better. <laughs> right? But she's going to some kind of event, and she has this idea, and so she sits down at the computer to do like one last thing. I know none of you have ever done this to your spouses who are anxious to go to said social event. event. And Annie Leibovitz, in this kind of moment, like sneaks over, right? as I imagine she often does, um, with her camera, and she like manages to capture this at the exact moment that Susan Sontag looks up, recognizes what is happening, and, and flashes back onto this quote. <laughs> right? And so I read this quote and this image together um, as a way of introducing them to Susan Sontag, right? as a really important thinker, as a way of opening up a text that is dense but incredibly relevant, um, and making it meaningful in their own lives. Right? Um, making these people real, <laughs> making their situations accessible, right? Again, re-familiarizing themselves, right? Giving my students a place in these texts. 
um, and a way of, of, of understanding them. Um, uh, and I do this with a lot of stuff. Like I love pulling weird stuff that they would not find on their own that, that has meaning in their lives. The other one I really love that goes along with the same quote um, is this image from 1974, right? This is Nam June Pike's uh, TV Buddha, right? Um, and now this is like, you know, and then we could talk about, well, how does the framing of Buddhism, you know, change, right, this relationship of staring at the self through TV? Is this an example of narcissistic self-surveillance? And then we get into a whole speculation of, is this what Sontag is talking about? And what does it mean for us to identify a figure like the Buddha as narcissistic, right? Like what's the, what is the, and then they get to talk about Nam June Pike and right, and I go into a whole, um, right, a whole kind of exciting, exciting thing there. Um, one of the other kind of mid-century theorists that I'm, I'm really into at the moment, this is the other thing, is I really only talk about things that I, uh, I think are fun. I really, I try to avoid things I don't think are fun. And if I have to teach something that I don't think is fun, I try to find the most fun part of it, <laughs> right? Because no one ever takes a theater class because it's a good idea. <laughs> right? No one's like, yep, yeah, well, you know, I guess I'll be a theater major because, you know, we've got to pay the bills. <laughs> right? No. Nobody does that. Nobody does that. Everybody does it because it's fun. Right? You take a theater class because it's fun. Right? Maybe you also are being cynical and you think it's an easy A. Right? But usually most of us got into this because there was something pleasurable about it. Right? Um, so I try to remind and feed on that impulse in my students. Right? That theory is fun. It's fun because it connects to things that you're doing. It's fun because it's interesting on its own. It's fun because these are weird little detective puzzles. It's fun because it puts you in conversation and in dialogue with other people and other times who did really strange kind of weird, wonderful things, right? Like I don't show them the picture of Susan Sontag looking like a lioness like with the silver streak, right? They'll find that on their own. I show them her in a teddy bear costume, right? Um, Jacques Ellul is another uh, theorist that I've been super, super into lately. Um, Technological Society, originally written in French in 1954, translated into English um, in, 19, in 1964. By the way, I'll make all these slides available, so um, if you miss something or you want to get some of this quote. Um, and I use this, I use this a lot. Um, and uh, and uh, you know, he talks a lot about what he calls technique. Right? And he's a contemporary of McLuhan. Um, not usually as, as, as well cited in the literature as McLuhan, but certainly not unknown in media studies and communication studies. Um, and he has this idea of, of the machine being autonomous, right? And then structuring human behavior according to its own rules and social behavior according to its own rules. But when the machine goes away, right? And, and, the, and my students often like, kind of have a, have a tough time with this. So I eventually found the perfect way of illustrating this. And so hope, hopefully my video will work again. Okay. Try. I got my whole life in this thing. Check out this new song I'm mixing. Still rough. All oh, artists say that. Got the new uh, Rock Away campaign. Shot it in Aspen. I think it's kind of cool. Love playing chess online. Hold on. This game is over. I wonder if he knows. Vacation photos you won't see in the tabloids. Uh, new Frank Gary plans for my team in Brooklyn. See that? Cool. Just start organizing my world tour. Trying to be a rock star and a role model. Got to track all my investments because I'm retired, right? <laughs> my passport says Sean, but you may know me by another name. Holla. HP Pavilion Entertainment Notebooks with Intel Centrino Duo Mobile Technology. The computer is personal again. <laughs> I love this, right? I could watch this and talk about this all day long, right? You want to talk about neoliberalism? Right? Like person as brand, person as generating, right? Um, individual wealth, right? Per, and that that uh, and that the mechanism is technological and based in the computer, but the computer is not is not present, right? 
Jay-Z operates according to the rules of the computer and everything that he creates, right, this kind of interesting synthesis between right, his hands, right, the hands of an artist, um, and, the, the, and I, I find the framing of this also really compelling, right, that we never see his face, we don't need to see his face, right, it's his hands and his suit and the, the tie and the, right, all of this kinds of stuff. So we spend a lot of time kind of playing around um, in that image as well. And it becomes a really helpful way of illustrating um, some of the things that, that um, Alul is interested in. Um, and then I also put uh, theorists in conversation with each other, right? Um, so I mentioned it uh, uh, whenever it was the last time you were forced to listen to me, Tuesday, I think. Um, and, uh, and I was interested that actually um, Auslander also mentioned Nick Coldry. Um, this is from a, um, and I, I don't know if, if Phil knows this, this, this book. It, it came out in 2017. Um, I've been uh, getting a lot of traction out of it. I should uh, give credit to Will Lewis, um, who's uh, just finishing up his, uh, uh, his graduate studies. He just, he just defended his dissertation at the University of Colorado uh, Boulder. Um, uh, I was one of the external readers on his, on his committee. Um, and this is a, a, a book that featured very prominently in his work on the changing role of the spectator uh, in, digital, in digital culture and digital contexts. Um, and uh, and, and I, I, I've been really into some of the work that they've been doing, um, particularly in this book. There are a couple of articles that are really helpful also. Um, and so I, uh, this makes perfect sense to my students also. Right? I kind of brought this up towards the end of my class in the, in the spring semester. Um, this idea that they never exist independent of, uh, of media. Um, and the example I always give is that, you know, once you become really invested in Instagram, you will never see the world the same way again, right? Every sunset is like, ah, uh, is it worth, <laughs> you know? And this gets, goes back also to, to the lenses, right, and this idea of like, world, right, as potential, like, opportunities for data analysis. Or when, um, when Steve Barry talked about, right, that he now sees the world in terms of data structures, right? Um, which, you know, I mean, I, I, I think is true, and I think the work that he's doing is really interesting, but we can extrapolate from that mindset pretty quickly to a kind of colonial mindset, which is seeing the world in terms of what we can get out of it, right? Like, seeing the world as raw resource, for us to extract, process, and distribute, right? Collect, analyze, disseminate, right? Um, now, that's not to say, I, I, mean, I should be really careful here, I'm not meaning to call either of those people colonial <laughs> um, or, or imperial, right, or to suggest. It's simply that to say that, again, when we start talking about pedagogy and teaching, that we can start drawing some connections very quickly to a pretty wide range of areas um, and, and that, again, I mean, I know some of us, like, you know, teach more in, right, in embodied modes and physical modes, right? These video and these sort of pop culture things also help us access that. Yeah, Christine? Um, so one of the readings that, I, I mean, the readings have been so fantastic, but one that I've been really excited by is the work of art in the age of digital media. Yes, I yes, the movie. Even the title wrong. But the, one of the things that really struck me that I'm kind of seeing and what you're doing here is this idea that we've moved from, you know, t the age of technological reproduction, which is defined by exhibition, yes, to the age of digital reconstruction, which is defined by manipulation. Yes. And it seems like what's very exciting to me about the examples that you're giving and thinking about how that works with teaching, but also where my own mind has got up to and not much further, sure. is I feel right on that nexus of, under of understanding the move between exhibitionism to manipulation as a primary mode of dealing with the world through media. And I, I, I kind of think maybe our students are sort of on the curve towards manipulation further than someone of my age. You know, you know, but, but, but the, the collision point between exhibition and manipulation as a mode of being in the world is, is Instagram, isn't it? Mm. Well, it, kind of. it, it? Among other apps, yeah. right? I mean, um, uh, you know, Snapchat filters um, are certainly a major key, key part of that. Um, 
and uh, you know, and I'm I, I I am I really enjoy like the little AR uh, animations, right, where you can get your Bitmoji um, to to do various things. So I have like a little video of my Bitmoji. Um, like taking notes and falling asleep on top of a copy of Artaud's Theater and It's Double, right? Which I think is just un endlessly witty, you know. Um, that's a joke that I try with my students occasionally and it, it takes a bit of belaboring and then by then it's not funny anymore. But, but yes, I mean, I think, and, and of course, you know, for some of us, we feel the momentum and the shift from one thing to another. Um, our students are not necessarily aware of that shift um, because they haven't felt that shift. So in that instance, I'm always trying to kind of shift them back. Um, but one of the other interesting examples that I give is when we read The Importance of Being Earnest, I also give them this essay, which is about his train lecture tour that he did in the United States in, I think it was like 1892, 1893, so a couple of years before he wrote Importance of Being Earnest. Um, you're fact-checking me mentally. Do you want to look it up? <laughs> Hang on, I'm sorry. I think it was closer I, to that. Oh, you're probably right. Somebody, okay. no, I'm not necessarily. Someone with a glowing. <laughs> this is. Do I get your credit if I find out? You do. You do. Absolutely. You fact check me, and I'm wrong. Go for it. Um, <laughs> what's interesting about that? Whenever it happened, maybe it was. Maybe it was the 80s. If, it's, if it is the 80s, it's like the very late 80s because it's 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 pretty close to when Importance of Being Earnest um, comes out. But what's interesting is is. It was 1882 is the one that I... 82? When was the Co second one? Lucy Coe organized it. When was the second? He oh, didn't... It was, yeah, the second one. Okay, that's the one I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> he, did do, he did go twice. I, be, I thought the second one was, was, was closer to the... It's, um... No? I'm, I'm just not gonna... laughing at myself. No, you, why are you laughing? I, you I should be laughing at me. Face. And not in a nice way. <laughs> These are the pity, pity chuckles I get down in the front. I appreciate that also. <laughs> anyway, while, while, we are, while we are fact checking, right? Um, uh, he had his image, right, as he circulated. Um, and the trains actually helped him stay one step ahead of bad reviews that would come out in newspapers in response to his performance. So he basically got to refine his TED talk before people figured out that the TED talk was not any good, right? Because of the train travel. And he also circulated his image as an advertisement on these little train cards, right? So he was sort of uh, depicted as the kind of quintessential aesthete with the, the, the fop haircut and the, and the sunflower and the little knickers and the furs and many of the images that, that circulated that we were most familiar with, right? And so we kind of read that back against Right, the importance of being earnest, both how the importance of being earnest trades on train travel as a way of reinventing yourself mm -hmm. and giving you access to different spaces in which you can refine your presentation of self in everyday life to, to go back to Goffman. Um, but then the students, when they do projects on this, they talk about Finsta and Insta, right? right? And the Insta is your Instagram, right? Um, and then there's your Finsta, which is your fake Instagram. <laughs> Right? And that's the one that you like share with your parents. And the one that you present, right, that you make available to employers. Right? So they get the importance of being earnest like that. They're like, why, well, yes, I am one way in the city and another way in the country. Right? Um, and they also understand um, that play in terms of social media, right? In the way that people are performing and constructing alternative identities and the way that those circulate. And then we kind of look at them in the context of, of, of train travel and images, and then we compare that to contemporary like publicity and celebrities and this idea of endorsements, right? And then you can kind of spin that off in any number of different directions, depending on who your students are, right? Um, and again, much of this, much of this material is, is, is readily accessible, um, I mean, in terms of ability to get it. Um, uh, with this one, um, I show this one in a, in a combination uh, because I'm always very cognizant of wanting to reach as many people as possible. Um, and so I, I, I try very hard to, uh, to mark, but also then to, to limit some of my biases. So, um, so I try to get them to see this not just in terms of entertainment and pop culture and, and things like that, but in, in, in other spaces, right? So I, I show them this combination of images. Um, this is um, uh, a gathering of, of the faithful near St. Peter's to witness Pope John Paul II's body being carried into the basilica for public viewing 
um, um, in, in 2005. Okay. Um, this next image is um, the installation of Pope Francis at the same basilica um, in 2013. Right? 2005, 2013. Right? Um, and then, you know, from the sacred to the profane, depending on your point of view, I suppose. <laughs> My son would really object. He was like, from one sacred to another sacred. <laughs> yes. Did you hear that recently Pope Francis said that the mass was not a show and people should not be using their phones? Yes. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Which, which tells you something yeah. about what's been happening in mass lately, right? Um, <laughs> I was thinking of this when, when Auslander was talking about the Beatles at Shea Stadium, right? Um, and I'm like, wow, they just needed to overcome that with better amplification, right? <laughs> okay. better moment. All right, hang on one second. I have to do one thing to, uh, uh, forgive me. Where did my, mm -hmm. I should have just like let it play and then I would have figured it out. Um, there's one particular section in this that I really, um, that I really love. And so, it's worth this in, in, inconvenience. Okay, hang on. Okay, great. Um, okay, we'll go here. And now I've broken it completely. <laughs> Super strange. You're in the slideshow. Well, I know. That's why I should be able to. Okay, let me try one more thing. That is disappointing. Um, so the, the, the key image here is basically that as Beyonce performs, let me try one more thing, and then we'll come back. Maybe I'll get rid of my mirrored displays. Maybe that was the problem. Can you play it in the Yeah, well, yeah play it there and then enlarge it. Yeah, maybe. It's, for whatever reason, the file is, like, is not happy at the moment. <laughs> oh, look at that technology. Um, huh? Wow, she does not like being interrupted. My bad. Um, the 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 kind of key moment here um, that that I would show you, if not for the spinning uh, beach ball of death. All right, I'm just going to try and play this, and if it doesn't work, then we're done. This is this is not an unfamiliar uh, <laughs> dynamic, right? Because the, nothing makes you a bigger tech idiot than standing in front of a classroom, right? It's like all your skills instantly disappear. 
All right, let me see if I can find us here. Okay. Okay. So there's a moment, I encourage you to watch this. It's, a, it's just like somebody's YouTube video. Just Google Beyonce Formation Tour uh, London. And um, uh, I'm so glad this was being live streamed also, right? <laughs> like, like, I'm so glad we could maximize the audience for this. Um, and basically what's kind of wonderful is that you get, like, the, you get our cell phone with all the other cell phones, and then we watch Beyonce come up and it's fabulous, and then we watch her come down the middle. So this person's got like killer seats, right? And Beyonce comes down the middle, you know, promenade part of the stage, and the camera, you know, follows. And then we're watching, oh, it's the back of her and her dancers. And now we can't see anymore. And there's this kind of wonderful moment where the camera, where the phone kind of hovers. And then it turns back to videotape the screen because despite the physical proximity, like, you can't actually see Beyonce very well, but she's like, you know, like a million feet tall up on the screen. So that is a better thing to film. Um, and, uh, you know, and when I'm more in control of my technology, I can do this. And then I talk, and they, of course they all know this, and nothing gets them more, and, you know, like I, I use formation very strategically in my classes, right? Because this is like Beyonce is one of the great unifiers, right, of my classes. Like I very rarely get people who have never heard of her or have no interest in her. Um, and then I talk to them about the design, which of course is created by a theater person, um, as Devlin. Um, uh, who's designed at the Royal Court, uh, among, other, among other places, and has done some really fun, fun stuff. And so then that gives us an opportunity to start thinking then about the role of design. And these are, this is one of Devlin's early sketches for this, this tour. Um, and again, like, so one of her first ideas is that there's this rotating box. Right? Um, again, as Mike told you on the first night, I am obsessed with boxes. Um, this is another set that Devlin did for the Nether at the Royal Court um, in, uh, in 2014 that I saw. It was described, this is a, about virtual environments, um, played by the American playwright um, Jennifer Haley. Um, people described the set as being in a glass box, um, but in fact it wasn't. It was actually, um, uh, it was symmetrically placed plastic trees um, in front of mirrors that were out of sight lines. Um, so that you, and, and opposite each other, so that the parallax view created by the mirrors on the three sides of the stage created the impression of a virtual box in the stage space that you had, right? So she materially created virtuality. Theater magic. <laughs> Loved it, right? Um, and this gets my students very, then very excited about uh, design and theater and different kinds of theater right, and, and, bringing, um, and bringing these things together. But then again, also goes back to that Cauldrian and Hep quote about, right, what we expect to see, how our views have changed, where technology lives, and how often we misunderstand what we are looking at, right? Um, and this is also a really helpful moment when I can then take a moment to talk about the things I do not know, which are significant, right? I learn more of them every day. It's really depressing. Right? I knew so much more when I was younger. Right? <laughs> um, uh, and then I give them, you know, so this is just, these are some other um, shows. I won't spend a ton of time on them. Um, this is, uh, uh, my voice has an echo in it by temporary distortion. This is uh, a box uh, performance, durational for six hours. There's two two-way mirrors on either side of the box, so you can look in, but they actually can't see out. Um, but of course, as part of this, this is um, Kenneth Collins. Um, who is reading Marshall McLuhan, right? The media is the, um, is the, is the message, from the massage. Um, uh, but that's what it looks like inside the box, right? Um, which we then talk about YouTube, right? As like diary and megaphone, right? As solo performance and worldwide performance. And this sensation that you are close to someone, right? Because you are, you know, because you can see them close up but they don't necessarily see you, even if you think they are looking at you. And we talk about tropes of music videos. Um, and then I have them make, uh, make music videos, right? Um, so they can take a piece of music and they can recut. And I give them the essay on 
work of art in the age of digital recombination, and then they use that as, a, as principles. Right? Um, and I, I make sure that this is set up, so my students tend to be fairly technologically advantaged, but they weren't always so much so. Um, so, but you can do a lot of things with text messages. So I have them make, I've had students make um, whole stories and narratives out of text messages. I don't know if you read in the New Yorker recently, there's a, a new um, narrative um, called, uh, and, and television story called, um, I think it's Scam, S-K-A-M. It's like a teen drama, but it's told entirely through apps and online, right? So you kind of have to follow it like a scavenger hunt through various kinds of, of, of media. Um, I, I just discovered it. I haven't really played around in it. I will absolutely teach that um, and, make, and make it available. Um, I talk about Dries Verhoeven quite a bit. Um, so this is another box performance. This is, uh, he did Want to Play, Love in the Time of Grinder. So I talk about, gives me an opportunity to talk about dating apps, um, sexual ethics, uh, privacy concerns. Uh, this caused a big controversy because when he was doing this in Berlin, um, so he would chat with people and try to get them to come to his box to, uh, to engage in, in intimate non-sexual activities, is the exact phrase. So like holding hands, making pancakes, um, uh, sitting quietly for an hour, uh, sharing a meal, um, things like this. And then one day, he started chatting with this guy who he rather liked. And he's got a little coy. And so he said, should I tell you where I live? I have a very unusual living arrangement. He's living in the middle of a public square. This is um, uh, like just the middle of the street. And uh, my friends in Utrecht who, who, who were seeing it when, when he was there, he, they referred to it like, it was like, like Dries was the town pet, right? Everybody kind of got to be like, what's going on Dries right now? And then they kind of go away. Uh, but in Berlin, he, you know, there was this kind of exchange. He wasn't totally forthcoming when the guy he was chatting with showed up. Um, he realized that, um, that all of his chats as well as his um, grinder profile had been broadcast and made physically available and on the on the LED screens on the side of um, of Dries's box. Um, there's Dries again. Um, oh, that's another picture. Um, and uh, and became very angry and there was a whole uh, uh, a whole outburst. They closed um, the the show early. Uh, Dries and and the theater both apologized, although it was a kind of not quite full-throated apology, right? I mean, I don't think he, uh, it, was a, it was an apology, but, um, and it brings this whole idea of privacy, right? Like, what are the expectations of privacy when you are on an online dating app, right? Um, that Grindr has, you know, millions of people uh, on, so you are ostensibly visible, but what are, the, what are the rules, what are the expectations of that level of privacy versus 20 people being able to see that, but in a public sphere, how does that shift? Right? And so it also becomes an opportunity to talk with my students um, uh, about that. I was thinking a lot about what, something you were talking about with your, with your project, Rye, and, and sort of being interested in this intersection of, of transness and, digital, and digitality and how those things connect. Um, and so uh, the, another series, this is uh, the Cécile pas series, right? So obviously taken from the Magritte um, and the Foucault. Um, this is a series of, of boxes that would be placed in a public square and closed in the morning. And then as they opened, they would reveal a different um, person inside of them. Right? Um, and uh, the ethics of display and access. So this is not my body. This is not the future. Um, these caused, a hu again, not a small amount of, of, of controversy. Um, and I was thinking actually of this, in addition to, bless you, uh, of Fiona from Shrek. I know, hard to connect those two things. Um, you, I can't go back. But the idea that, um, that, the, that the form or the frame is always independent of, the way, of what's inside it, I, I, don't, I can't quite go there, right? Um, in part because these, right, this is not nature, um, in part because these, radically shift the idea of our frame um, and our sense of what is the social, what is the public, based solely on what is our relationship and our ideas about the bodies that are in these boxes, right? Um, and and I, think, I think there's something really compelling there. And they, again, become, right, to what, what kinds of display do we sanction, right? What kinds of display do we fear? Um, what kinds of display 
do we think are okay? One of the things that um, Dries has on his website, he says, uh, unsuspecting passerbys are encouraged by the business-like presentation to determine their position in relation to these controversial images. Why are some images considered tainted when they were tolerated just 20 years ago? Have we become less malleable as a species? Or have we simply lost our naive political correctness? You, you know, he's kind of into provoc provocativeness, provocation. Is it good that our children do not see certain things, or have we gone to the extremes in our drive to protect? Um, another piece that he did that I, I rather like, and I talk to my students quite about, quite a lot about, is um, Guilty Landscapes. Um, this is actually a, um, it looks like single channel video, but it is in fact an interactive piece um, in which you observe a person, right, in a, on a, it's, a, it's a, for one person at a time, so one viewer goes into a kind of gallery white cube um, museum space. Uh, you see a person in a so-called guilty environment, right, so a place in the world that is directly suffering as a result of the industrial world's choices. Right? So where the impact of, of industrial society, right? where this is felt globally, unseen, right? in these landscapes, that's where the guilt comes in. And you see a person, and then you realize at a certain moment that in fact that person also sees you. And you realize that because they begin imitating you. And then there becomes a kind of mirror game of exchange. Um, of, and so all of a sudden this idea of distance and separation becomes immediately collapsed and you become implicated in the landscape and you become seen in your space, right? In your highly privileged, right? Um, fortunate space. Uh, that is the result often that privilege and that comfort of what you are seeing in the, in the guilty landscape. And there's a, a whole series of these. They're quite, quite profound. Um, and this one is um, in Thailand and in fact, the, uh, the young man uh, takes off his clothes and encourages you to do the same. Um, and then the last uh, artist that I'll talk about, I, I think it's the last artist. No, it's not even close to the last artist. I have a bunch more. Um, uh, this is Chris Verdonk. I'm not going to say too much about Verdonk because um, uh, Peter Eckersall uh, and New Media Dramaturgy talks quite a lot and has worked very closely with Christoph von Barl. Um, von Barl, by the way, is, is Chris Verdonk's um, dramaturg um, and someone who works in a mode that made me think very much of your project, Christine, um, with, with Chris Verdonk. Chris is a, has a history as, a, as an engineer and as an artist, but was also trained in theater. And he has always worked with, with dramaturgs, even on pieces that like, have no semblance of text. Um, so his dramaturg for a long time was the famed European dramaturg Marianne van Kukhoven. Um, Babokov, I believe, um, and now it's Christoph von Barl, and then and he does these really kinds of compelling. And that's not to say that I don't sometimes take ethical issue um, with Verdonk's work, uh, particularly around questions of gender. Um, but but it's always compelling. Um, and this is a piece called Isos, um, which is based on the International Standard um, Standardizations Organization that controls um, shipping, global shipping, and IT protocols. Um, and, and these are not unrelated. The subject matter that, that Verdonk draws on um, is based in, in um, stories uh, by J.G. Ballard, um, particularly the Atrocity Exhibition, among others, um, which is a very interesting text if you've not read that recently because it's written entirely in paragraphs that are boxes. Right? So if you read the text, it's like these, right, each kind of part of the story, each rendering is in these rectangles, it's in these boxes. Um, uh, really provocative, provocative book. Um, so Chris builds these boxes. There's an array of nine boxes. Um, you look down in the boxes through stereoscopic glasses that are in the top. And inside, we can also ask um, Ashley Farrow Murray about this um, because in fact he filmed this at MPAC, um, uh, the Experimental Media and Performing Arts Center at, um, at RIT, I think I'm getting that right, um, in Troy, New York. Um, it's bef I believe he did this before, before Ashley got there, but, but it's um, in that facility. Um, and then within, what he did is he shot um, for the performers from above with a 3D camera against uh, a gridded backdrop, so black with white lines to create a really strong sense of 3D. So when you look down through the top, um, uh, 
this is one of his images. I have a couple that are mine. Um, it looks as if the people, and then he projects on the bottom of the box, um, which continues the frame. So it really looks like these people are, are living three-dimensional beings in a box, but they're about two-fifths scale of an actual human being. He calls them the creatures. They're completely bizarre. Um, mostly, right, so, and then, and then they kind of reenact um, images or ideas that he draws from, from Ballard short stories. Um, so we watched, this is, um, this is from one of the short stories called Escapement, um, in which uh, a couple, bourgeois couple, uh, is, is uh, hanging out watching television, and the, the husband notices that in the television he's watching the same, the same stories coming up over and over again, but as if it's breaking news, and so he realizes that he's caught in a temporal loop. And so he keeps trying to figure out how to get out of it or how to hang on. Um, and of course, these are all recorded temporal loops um, that we're watching. Um, and there's also this moment where he talks about hugging the TV. And one of the characters says, don't hug the television. Right? And then you realize that you're watching it like this. <laughs> you know, that you are literally hugging, hugging your TV. Right? Um, I was thinking of this when someone mentioned like the whole leaning back versus leaning in versus like climbing, climbing upon. And then they look at you, right? Which is just like, <laughs> kind of marvelous, kind of marvelous. Um, uh, this would be an earlier one that called In, um, which is uh, another part of my obsession with boxes and Verdonk um, and, 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 and uh, some of my questions around gender and how he um, approaches that in, in some of this. So um, when you ask him about these, the different people that are in these boxes, and this is, this is live, you walk around a box with a, a human being in it, um, submerged in water um, with an air hose that goes to a tank, uh, an oxygen tank outside the aquarium. Um, the woman is dressed as a maid uh, or maybe a waitress and her, her body position is this. The man is dressed in a three-piece suit with a briefcase um, and his body position is this, right? When you ask him about that, he's Chris like, it's just people. You're just, just a slice of life, just people. <laughs> um, okay, Jenna and Kimmy and Mike, I was thinking that, you know, this is somebody who, these are people you really need to know if you don't already, um, which is the critical engineers. This is another, another um, artist group that, uh, that I talk a lot about with my students. Um, because I see them, you know, living in a society that now, right, just like compels them and, and encourages them to fling their data and their information around willy-nilly, you know, because they can get like, you know, five buck off coupons, right, um, somewhere. The critical engineers are wonderful, um, and because a lot of what they do um, is, uh, is, is really critical, but also really dangerous, like they know how to protect themselves. Um, and uh, the project that I wanted to talk about, which would go back to, um, to Andrew and his, his flip phone, um, is a piece called um, uh, Border Bumping. And so this is Julian Oliver. We brought him to the University of Buffalo through the Techne Institute for Arts and Emerging Technologies in 2013 to do a project across the Niagara River, so across the US um, ca um, Canadian border there. And, um, and what he did is he basically wrote, wrote an app that you could download onto your phone that would track and broadcast which cell tower you were connected to at any given moment. And then as you crossed the border, it would redraw the border in real time, not based on where the border was as a kind of geopolitical boundary, um, but according to when the cell towers thought you had crossed the border, which is not at all aligned with the actual physical border, as anyone who lives on Beaver Island, right, um, or Fort Erie can tell you every once in a while, people on the, uh, living in, on the American side would get charged with international roaming on their cell, cell phones because for whatever reason, the cell tower across the river had picked them up and everything that they were doing in that instance, right, even though they were in their own living rooms, right? So this is the, this is the project that he did, so he identified all these different cell towers that went along the, the, the boundary, um, identified right, how the data is being exchanged. And he's done other projects that sort of illustrate how, like when you send an email, for example, how many computers it goes through, how vulnerable it is, and how you would never know. Right? Any of those servers could absolutely 
in, in, in milliseconds, you know, copy, store, whatever you would put there, and, and, and you would never be the, never be the wiser. So he's, um, uh, and then it would, again, um, redraw the border in, in, in real time. Um, the other one, kind of along these lines that he made, um, uh, is the transparency grenade. Um, this is like a super illegal um, piece of, of, of equipment, um, art project. Um, but basically what this does is, is the, so the, this is the transparency grenade, grenade um, uh, made in the body of a, of a metal and silicone F1 Soviet hand grenade. Um, it's equipped with a tiny computer, a microphone, and a wireless antenna. And basically what it does is when you pull the pin, it captures all of the network traffic and audio at the site of the grenade. And then it securely and anonymously streams it to a dedicated server where it is mined for information. And then email fragments, H, um, HTML pages, images, and voice extracted from the data, right? So everything that's on your phone right now, um, then gets presented as an online public map where it went off, right? Um, so he basically captures everything that's kind of spinning around. And again, the, the critical engineers is all about awareness and, and, and exploit as a form of education, right? Like making us aware of what we're doing moment to moment, what, we, what our vulnerabilities are, um, and, and how these play out in the world. Okay, um, and there it is. And then you can see stuff from your phone suddenly broadcast because right now, you know, very few of us have encrypted all of the data on our cell phones. And so it just, but we're all connected to a, a Wi-Fi network, right? And it could at any moment like, right? Um, so if you want to talk security, these are your guys. <laughs> and Julian's very nice, um, really wonderful. New Zealander living in Berlin, uh, really smart, very wonderful person. Um, the last piece I want to talk about is, uh, uh, is, is Luke um, uh, Dubois. And uh, Luke is a, originally a composer, computer musician, um, uh, uh, does a lot of, of, of data and, and digital art now. We had him at, at Bowdoin. We had a retrospective called Now at the Bowdoin Museum of, uh, College Museum of Art. Um, and what he did, this is not so unrelated to, to what Denise is doing, um, he joined a number of dating net app networks um, across the country as a, uh, as a man seeking women, as a man seeking men, as a woman seeking men, as a woman seeking women, uh, I, and, and anything he did as a man and woman seeking both. Anyway, he went through and like developed every conceivable profile on something like, like 12 dating apps. Um, and then he mined all the data. <laughs> Right? Everything, because once you're in the network, you have access to the network, right? And then he um, correlated that with census data and, um, and began to reanalyze the United States population. Now, again, these are the single population and people who are on the dating apps, right? Um, uh, with measures, uh, of, with new kinds of measures. So this is a measure of shyness. Right, based on how people identified themselves on these on these dating apps, so um, so the the darker um, so the the, the the darker it is, the sh uh, well, I'm trying to think. It's the oh yes, the, the brighter it is, the shyer you are, um, and then the um, and then it's it's mi it, women are red and, and men are blue, uh, and then they get mixed in purple, and so now you have an image of the United States. Um, based on, on levels of shyness. Um, the other piece that, that my students and I spent a lot of time playing around with and had a really good time with um, is that he then went through um, and he um, uh, collected um, basically uh, all of the words and did a, a huge kind of text mining project for the words that were used in all of these in all of these um, uh, in online dating profiles. And then he redrew the United States map and identified every city by what word was used there more than anywhere else in the country. <laughs> so we are currently, I don't know if you can see this, we are currently in waiting 
Georgia. <laughs> Some of us will take airplanes to fly out of company, Georgia. Right? Um, I come from incorrigible Maine. <laughs> Um, but I was born in afternoon California. Right? Um, and this is an interactive map that you can go to um, and, um, and, and, and check it out. Uh, the last thing I wanted to do before, uh, before we play around with that, let me see if I can call up my, um, is to point out a few different resources um, that are available um, for teaching and research. Um, people had mentioned earlier syllabi. Um, that are related to this. I don't know if anyone's had the chance to, to check out this website. This was created by Scott Mogelson and Henry Vile in conjunction with their 2010 critical interventions in theater historiography. Um, and it has a number of, this is in the faculty club, it has a number of syllabi that people have used. Um, I haven't checked it recently to see if there's anything particularly on, on digital, um, but I think it's a really helpful resource in a number of other domains. Um, the other two, I know we're kind of running out of time, so I can make some of these links available elsewhere. Um, but the other one that I wanted to, to point out is that a, a few years ago, yes, I need to renew my Aster membership. Um, <laughs> my bad. Is, um, is the Aster member group um, for digital research and scholarship. Um, and, and, and this is a group that I created uh, in 2014, 2015. I haven't done very much with it for the last year, so my, my apologies. Um, but if you click into, into the group, um, it has a number of different resources that are there, um, including a kind of overview. And then if you go up, whoop, whoa, hmm. let's try this again. Um, if you go up into group pages, um, there is a digital resources guide, again, as of 2015, so take it for what it's worth, um, a list of projects. Um, where you can list your project and also see, I think, the three projects that have been listed there. We need to populate that. Um, but more interesting, I think, for our purposes today, there's a thing on copyright information. Um, I circulated a thing on Twitter last night also that I think is really great. Um, there's a lot of good stuff. Is the tool shop. Um, and this is basically um, a, a list of various kinds of tools, many of them open source. Um, but several of these are links to directories. So the DIRT directory um, is, is really one of the best resources um, that, you can, that you can find online. And they do a much better job of updating of what they're doing than, than I do. Um, but the Aster Group is a, is a, is a nice um, starting place. The other thing that the Aster Group does is we have shared, um, a shared Zotero library. Um, so I mentioned Zotero earlier. It's a citation management system um, like Mendeley or EndNote, um, but it's web-based um, and it's also it can be collaborative. So you can share um, you can share these libraries, um, and then everybody who is a member of the group can. Um, uh, oh, I need to log in. My bad. Um, anyway, you can go in and you can access. Um, you can upload things. You can download things. You can copy things to your own <coughs> library. Um, but it becomes a kind of shared, a, a shared online resource um, that's helpful there as well. Um, and then the, the last thing I wanted to, to, to mention is, um, is a couple of other uh, resources um, online in this. One is um, Matthew Gold's um, edited Debates in the Digital Humanities uh, has a website. So it's, there are two um, editions of the print book. Um, but, this is, uh, but this is also an online that you can go in and out of. Um, and I've, again, used this with my students as well. Um, and in fact, much of what the University of Michigan Press is doing now, so if you, Mike, Mike mentioned um, uh, enjoying the, the conclusion, right, that we had from the you know, writing history in the digital age, that entire book is actually available online, um, as are another. So this also becomes a really, a, a, a really good, uh, resource for how to, how to use this. Um, and there are other collections, right, that, that are sort of along the lines of World Theater Map. Um, but these are some of the, the ones that I use most with my students. I think that's probably good for now. I apologize. Thanks so much for, for listening. A few moments for questions if you want to do that now. But of course, we have plenty of time this afternoon as well. Yeah, Mike.
Uh, I want to make sure I understand what kind of questions would be best for this context. So I have uh, kind of a simple practical question, but I also have a theoretical question about theory. Um, would that be better, maybe held for the afternoon, where it feels like maybe you have about the four minutes now? So I think the theoretical <laughs> questions are probably best held for the afternoon. Yeah. Great. Okay. So I have then that would be uh, what I think is a fairly simple question. Sure. You never defined theory. What do you mean by theory? Mm -hmm. That sounds theory. That That's not pretty. <laughs> I know. I was just going to be a jerk about it. You know, play that kind of game. Um, but, that, but that is the, that is the question. Yeah, so I mean, uh, so uh, one thing is that if anybody tells me it's theory, I believe them, right? So if somebody says, like, here is my theory of, I'm like, okay, I'll go with that. Um, but the other is that I, I, I do usually with my students a fairly, you know, extensive and energetic working up of, of, of theater and theory and their right root etymologies and the idea of seeing and the notion that theory is any kind of uh, approach to looking at something, right? Um, or considering it, right? I mean, I don't want to sort of overly privilege the visual in that, although I probably do. Uh, but yeah, it becomes a way of a, a way of looking at it and understanding. And 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 when we start talking in kind of digital culture, a lot of how I break that down is, you know, uh, is to sort of put theory in the in the in the category of analysis, right? So um, it's 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 how we make sense of it's how we make sense of things. It's how we process, right? What's, what's around us. And I mean, I think that there are a number of different definitions and ways to kind of engage with that. And it's also very disciplinarily specific, right? You know, your critical theory is my philosophy, right? Um, uh, and the way that these kinds of, you know, cross fields, and I'm pretty careful with my students in terms of understanding where different ideas come from dis disciplinarily and how they're deployed in that environment versus which is not to say that we can't use them in a totally different way if it's productive. Um, but again, always trying to kind of negotiate uh, and tie things back into the practical and the specific as much as I can. Yes, Christine. Um, this is kind of just a question about uh, gender in the digital humanities. Um, I've just noticed how many of the examples of artists and thinkers um, from nearly all of the presentations have been men. Yes. And I mean, I'm thinking particularly of Philip Auslander's presentation. In that entire presentation, there wasn't a female human being referred to as an artist or thinker, and you had the impression that there were no women in the world generating knowledge at all, you know, which puts a lot of burden on the females uh, to, rip, to put themselves back in. It's in a sort of form of invisible labor. And, you know, I mean, it's tr been true of almost all the presentations. And, um, and I'm kind of, I mean, I think perhaps it's part of the field that it's been a kind of tech geek, male-driven field in its genesis in terms of the tools under the hood in digital humanities a lot of the time. But I'm also really concerned as an educator and thinker and, and someone wanting to make resources available to my students how, about the work of making that visible and about perhaps resources for that or um, you know robust archives or lists of women artists and thinkers that we could also draw on or just at least to make it more visible and I, I'm not really seeing that work happening here in the foreground so I don't know if that's quite a question but it's something I've noticed and I'm really and I'm con concerned about well Kate Hales is, is really quite significant um, uh, uh, among others and, and becomes kind of a founding. I mean, I would actually say that DH, more than other aspects of media study, is, is fairly gender integrated. Um, uh, I don't know the specific statistics on that. Um, certainly there are a range of other, uh, of other artists uh, that, that we could look at. Mary Mattingly is a really interesting uh, artist and performer. Um, my former colleague Stephanie Rothenberg um, does wonderful stuff at the intersection of ecology and environmental science. Um, she's actually coming to Bowdoin next year as, a, as an artist in residence in the um, Rue Center for Environmental Studies. So she's an artist doing um, digital, uh, digitally informed work. So one of her pieces, um, I'm going to forget the name of it now, it has this, but it has this very funny pun. Um, basically takes da mines the web for data on micro lending and then applies that to a um, physical manifestation of, um, of these little seedlings and the amount of water 
that they are given based on micro lending patterns globally, right? And sort of like who's, you know, who's being drowned uh, and who's being, right, who's experiencing drought. Um, so there are a number of, 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 of different people to, to sort of, you know, point to. Um, you know, I, I apologize for my own sort of imbalance here. Uh, it's it's re organized around boxes, which I'm sure have more women playing around with them. If I could chime in there, too, yes, please. It's interesting that you mentioned Kathleen Hale. Um, in terms of the post-human, I'm thinking back at my guilt to leave, my presentation, but that, of course, Donna Haraway is yeah. the key figure, too. Right. So in that discussion, and I remember now thinking back when I put together that slide where I actually had Kathleen Hale's and Donna Haraway's the theorists, and then I had Stella, I didn't even name them, but I had just an image of, from Stellar and an image from Laurie Anderson. And I was actually, as I was putting the slide together, conscious of that gender balance. Mm -hmm. But for whatever reason, I think the postmodern, uh, the post human theory in particular, has been dominated by female theorists. Animal studies also. Yes. Right? Um, which is a kind of interesting. So, so okay. our third author on the taxonomy's book, right, is Jennifer for Parker Starbuck, who also wrote Cy Cyborg Theater. And she was the third figure on that slide, as I recall. There yeah. There was Haraway and. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I guess it's um, it's a question about public frames too. Yes. Um, yeah. Maybe I just got really annoyed by Philip Austin. Three cheers for annoyance. <laughs> 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 All right, shall we eat and then discuss? Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks very much. I appreciate it.